thanks so much um, for the invitation to give this uh, presentation here. Um, I'll be talking about jet physics um, for the EIC quite generally, um, and then focus on specific applications um, toward the electron ion collider. Um, and so let me start, even though, of course, you've seen this uh, before here at the summer school. Uh, let me start with the big picture. Um, so the goal eventually is to study um, the standard model of particle physics, um, and in particular, um, understand the fundamental structure of matter. Um, so if we basically look at smaller and smaller distance scales, can you, can you see my mouse the cursor, by the way? Just to check. Yes, yes. Yeah, okay, okay, great, thanks. Um, so if you look at small and smaller distance scales um, inside nuclei and, and protons and neutrons, um, we'll eventually find quark and gluon degrees of freedom. And so ideally what we want to do is we want to use that at the fundamental level and understand properties of protons and neutrons all the way up to heavy nuclei in terms of these fundamental um, degrees of freedom. Um, and so where jets basically come in is because they basically allow us in a very direct way, um, probe these quark and gluon degrees of freedom. And arguably, it's more direct probe um, than if you just observe um, the asymptotic states of QCD, which are hadrons. And so there's like some advantages that can be gained by, by thinking about this. Um, the way to do this experimentally um, is, of course, these high energy um, collider experiments. Um, a lot of progress, especially in jet physics, has been made. Um, over uh, the last years in the context of um, the LHC that you can see up here. Um, but jets have also been measured, of course, uh, at the relativistic high heavy ion collider at BNL, um, even more so at the future S Phoenix experiment. And then of course, um, which is the topic here, um, the electron ion collider, which will be upgraded to that in about 10 years from now. Um, so since I don't have any nice images from the IC yet, let me show some from the LHC. Um, so basically, um, accelerate um, particles to very high energies, uh, in this case up to 14 TeV, um, uh, and uh, at these accelerators at the LHC, um, and then we bring them uh, to collisions at the experiments, such as the Atlas experiment. Um, and then if when, when the experimentalists look at what they actually see in the detector, then they often find these kind of event displays that, that you can see here in this illustration of a particular event at, uh, at the Atlas experiment. Um, and so what you can see here is that generally um, the distribution of the final state particles is not somehow spherically symmetric, for example. Um, but instead, um, a lot of particles, a lot of energy is in, is in, in certain directions only. Um, so for example, here, if you look at sort of into the beam direction, um, then you can see a lot of energy deposited in this direction over here and maybe over here. Um, and, and, but it's basically not symmetric that the energy is sort of distributed everywhere. So we have these collimated sprays of particles, uh, which, which we refer to as jets, and we would like to understand the properties and compute them ideally from first principles uh, in QCD. Um, so here are two more illustrations of that. Of course, at the LHC, we can produce a lot of jets. Here in this case, um, we basically have two, a two jet event here, we have multiple jets. But in all of these cases, um, they basically directly reflect the underlying quark and gluon degrees of freedom, and they allow basically for a window into very short-lived um, quantum processes at very, very small scales, even though these are, of course, um, the macroscopic um, objects that we see in the detector. Um, and so let me start um, by saying a few words about um, basically the beginning of jet physics. Um, this really goes back um, to the 70s. Um, so this is the first paper the first experimental paper where um, people discuss basically evidence um, for jets structure. Um, so again, basically the, the fact that um, these final state events um, are more jet-like as opposed to these um, symmetric distributions here. Um, and um, as I tried to highlight here in this paper, they actually studied um, E plus E minus collisions at a center of mass energy of six to seven GeV. So even though at the LHC we're at 14 GeV now, here, the first evidence for jet physics um, was already achieved at six to seven GeV. And so that's, of course, much, much lower. Um, um, but that also gives sort of some indication when we think about the EIC, which is, of course, at much lower energies than the LHC. Um, also here, um, of course, we'll be able to see um, jets in, in some form. Um, so this was 1975. Um, so that's, that's going to be almost 50 years. Um, and 
a uh, little bit later um, was sort of the first paper um, for from the theory side for jet physics, um, where they wrote down the first jet algorithm. Um, I'll talk more about jet algorithms on the next slides, where we basically need a um, suitable convention how to exactly identify jets that works both for theory and that works for experiment. And this paper by, by George Sturman here at Stony Brook and Steven Weinberg, they wrote down the first definition and they were able to do the first next leading order calculation. Um, this is um, specifically a jet algorithm that works very well for E plus E minus collisions, where you basically don't have any preferred direction in the initial state. So you're just looking basically at final state QCD effects. Um, and you have a, a spherical symmetry, then these kind of algorithms work very well. Um, and they're actually still studied today um, in soft clean effective theory. For example, people look at these algorithms to resolve large logarithms. Um, but in PP collisions, um, very often people now use um, um, different types of algorithms that I'll introduce in the next slides. But this was basically the first one uh, where people were able to write down like a useful definition that is uh, basically infrared colony assay. Um, so, now today, of course, um, jets are really everywhere at the LHC. Um, around 60 to 70% of all the publications use jet physics um, one way or another. Um, they provide um, precision tests um, of the standard model um, of QCD in particular, but um, um, also, for example, boosted um, uh, resonances. That's, for example, illustrated here at the bottom. On the right, you can see basically a QCD-like jet where you have a lot of energy at the core of the jet. Uh, versus this is basically a Higgs candidate. So if you look at the internal structure of the jet, um, then you basically find it has sort of a two-pronged two structure. Um, and that's one of the signatures. So if you produce a Higgs, not at rest, but if it's boosted, then its decay products um, can be merged into a single jet. And so this, this um, can be one of the, one of the jets um, that, that may originate from a Higgs. So here, you very often then for searches, use jets um, to identify these boosted um, um, particles. Um, also in Hagan questions at the LHC and at RIC, um, jets play an important role because um, they can probe the core gluon plasma. Um, and um, that's what I'll talk about here um, is um, that they are basically now a new component um, of the EIC um, science program. Um, and, <clears throat> and what I'll only um, mention at the very end, um, jet physics actually also now allow us to, to think um, of pattern production in sort of a new way, like with all the progress that has been made in jet physics, um, that may actually also now allow us to think about pattern production in, in a new way. I'll, I'll just mention that briefly at the very end, because it's sort of not jet physics in the, in the traditional way. All right, so the first thing, of course, one has to um, talk about um, is how we actually define jets. Um, as I mentioned, we need sort of a prescription that works both for theory and experiment. And the guiding principle, of course, is that it works for theory, that we can do calculations uh, where we're not somehow left with like singularities, for example, at higher orders. Um, and so let me first introduce the two um, kinematic variables or three kinematic variables that we need to discuss jets uh, at collider experiments. And um, we have, of course, a transverse momentum um, that is relative, measured relative to the beam axis. And then we have two angles. Um, the first is the azimuth angle phi. So that's I'm trying to illustrate that here. That sort of goes around the two pi angle around the beam axis. And then we have the um, polar angle relative to the beam axis, which is um, theta, which is typically written in terms of the rapidity um, eta, basically including a log here, then that goes between plus and minus infinity. Where at infinity, you have the, uh, the beam direction. Um, and so then to, to talk about jets in sort of a very uh, intuitive way is, is to basically um, unravel sort of this cylinder and plot basically the hits that you have in the detector um, in the eta phi plane. And that gives you these Lego plots that you can see over here. So this is a simulation um, from Pythia uh, at the LHC, um, where you basically see a lot of particles that are being produced. Um, and so now the goal is basically to, to find exactly where the jets are. And so, of course, intuitively, um, one maybe can identify some of them here, should be probably one here, another one, and maybe a third one over here. Um, but of course, we need like an exact algorithm that tells us exactly where the jets are and what's their transverse momentum. Um, oops, all right. And so the, the algorithm that people typically use um, nowadays um, are uh, recursive clustering algorithms. And sort of the, the most popular one is uh, the um, so-called anti-KT algorithm, uh, which was developed by Kachari Salam and Soyes in 2008. 
And the way it works is that you define a pairwise distance between all um, the particles or hits that you see here in the detector. And then you basically recursively group particles together and then you still have a stopping criterion and to basically stop and call something a jet. And so um, there's different ways how to define a distance metric. Um, and sort of the one for anti-KT, that's the one that, that, that you can see here on the left. So the way it works is that it has um, basically two or three components. The first one is um, that it has basically um, the geometric distance in the eta phi plane here in the numerator. So that's really just the pairwise distance between um, each particles, uh, each of the particles here in the eta phi plane. So that's already what one would intuitively expect as a distance. But then in addition to that, um, and that actually would already be enough, but often um, then people use these additional factors here. So one is that you include um, uh, the minimum of the one over the transverse momentum squared of all the particles in the event. Um, so that basically means there's two ways to get a very small distance. One is that they're very close together in azimuth and angle, uh, azimuth uh, and, and rapidity, or if the transverse momentum is very large, so if I have a very energetic particle, then that will get associated uh, a very um, short distance. And so if I then look basically at all the distances, um, basically a long list of distances, um, of pairwise distances that I um, can write down for a given event, then I look at the one with the shortest distance and I basically group those two together. And so I merge these particles. Um, I basically just add up the four vectors. Um, I can do that also in a different way. There's different conventions how one can do it. Uh, with some advantages and disadvantages just here and there. Um, but so basically, if I have this additional one over kt squared, then I'm always going to start merging particles um, that um, are very energetic. And I start with those basically, and I group particles around that energetic particle uh, into, into a jet. <clears throat> and so the, the, the last thing we need is to basically, we need a criterion when to basically stop merging and clustering particles in this iterative process. Um, and that's basically um, given here by this beam distance. So in addition to the pairwise distances that I have in my list, and I look basically for the shortest distance, I also define a beam distance for every particle i in the event, which is just given by one over kt squared in that case. And um, so you, whenever a beam distance is identified as the smallest distance, um, then I will call that object a jet and I'll remove it from the list of particles that are, so, that are still going to be grouped together. And so to, to see basically what's the stopping criterion is um, like this one over KT is basically in both of those. And whenever I still, so when I have to look the question, do I want to add another particle to a jet or do I stop? Then I basically look at this distance here compared to R. So whenever that here is larger than one, then the beam distance is going to be the smallest. And then I basically stop clustering. But until then, I basically group particles together um, that are basically within a radius of R. So this parameter R here basically determines what sort of the catchment area of the jet. Um, and that's, that basically gives me my, my stopping criteria and then I identify the jet. So let's take a look at what happens uh, if we run that particular algorithm on this event configuration. Mm -hmm. um, then what we find is this, where we require at least um, a certain uh, transverse momentum um, of the jets. So like some of the particles, some of the soft particles you see here are actually removed. And so here, um, this was actually clustered with a jet radius of one. And you can indeed see, if you look at these colored patches here of the jets that were identified, they have um, basically in the eta phi plane, they have um, a radius of one. And so that's a very nice feature of specifically the anti-KT algorithm that you get these uh, like round jets, um, which has um, certain calculational advantages in, in many cases. Um, and because it gives you basically a fixed boundary and it's sort of not, not very fuzzy at the edge um, that often helps with calculations. Um, but also experimentally that can have important advantages so it's easier to basically calibrate the energy of jets and, and things like that. Um, what is important to point out though is um, that there's no unique definition of a jet. So we can like, like, like this algorithm like will give you an answer like a different algorithm will give you a different answer. Um, and so there's no, like a jet is not a uniquely defined object. It really just depends on the prescription that you're using. Um, and in general, any prescription is fine as long as you can basically make a one-to-one -one comparison between theory and data. And then that's, that's good enough and you can do the, the physics analysis, but there's no unique way of calling a group of particles or jets in somehow a unique way. Um, and to illustrate this a little bit uh, on the next slide, you can see um, again, the same event uh, where this is again, the unclustered event from before, and this is the anti-KT result for that particular event. 
Um, and so what I included here now in the distance metric um, is an additional exponent P, uh, where we, if we choose P equals one, we get the anti-KT result over here. Um, or if I choose that to be zero, so then that entire thing basically disappears, um, then I get the Cambridge Aachen algorithm that's here shown on the lower left panel. So I get different, a different set of jets. Um, for example, if you look at this one, like this um, patch over here, that's for example, completely gone over here. So with the Cambridge Aachen algorithm, that would not be considered a jet or it would basically fall below the transverse mention criteria that they require for the jets in that given event. Um, and also, of course, the area here changes um, depending on you know, which algorithm I'm using. And uh, again, if I choose here, for example, uh, minus one, so that will be the KT will be in uh, the numerator, um, then I get this distribution of jets, which again is different. So um, there's various different, and, and of course there are also other algorithms that don't rely on this recursive clustering, like Kona algorithms, um, or other way, other algorithms where I maximize some, some function. Um, and so again, all of these are fine as long as we can do a calculation for those. Um, now, in terms of calculations, of course, what we want to do is we want to do um, perturbative QCD calculations um, for this. So we want to start with our Lagrangian, um, which we can basically just summarize here in this one line in terms of quark and gluon um, fields. Um, and then we want to use that to eventually compare to a cross section. So how can we do that? Um, of course, we need to make use of asymptotic freedom. So in, in our Lagrangian, uh, we do have um, quark and gluon interaction vertices as well as um, gluon-gluon self-interaction vertices. And that leads to this important um, aspect of QCD, which is that the coupling constant um, will decrease as a function of the energy. So if I go to very high energies, then I'm in the region of asymptotic freedom. So if you look here, uh, this plot on the right, which is just a strong coupling constant um, from the latest, uh, I think the latest um, PDG, uh, or latest PDG results, um, then you see if we're at very high energies so of, um, in, for example, here a Q of say um, a thousand, um, or, um, or even more. So if, for example, at very highly energetic jets at the LHC, then we're definitely here in that area of asymptotic freedom. And so that's of course great, because um, that means if we want to write down any cross section, then um, we can basically do this perturbative expansion here where um, alpha S is small, and then I can eventually truncate here um, uh, the, this perturbative series expansion, as long as um, these coefficients here, of course, are sufficiently small. In many cases, they're not small, and we have to do additional um, uh, resummations of, for example, large logarithmic corrections. Um, but in general, that's sort of the idea of, of asymptotic freedom that we can truncate that series eventually, um, and that gives a sufficiently good approximation um, of the cross section. Um, and that for jets, for example, E plus and minus, that's really all, all, often all there is. But um, of course, with colliding hadrons, and if we're looking at low energy jets, for example, then we're also going to be sensitive. Um, not only to these high scales, but we're also going to be sensitive to the region of confinement. And so in one way or another, we eventually have to deal with um, basically the region of confinement and um, the region of asymptotic freedom. And so we basically have to separate those in a, in a systematic way, because here we can do perturbative calculations, whereas these re this region here is, is non-perturbative, and so we want to separate that. Um, and so um, what we need are QCD factorization theorems that uh, were first developed here in the 80s and 90s. Uh, and so let's take a look at a simple one um, that's been, of course, known for, for a while, um, still difficult to prove, and, and there are often sort of small loopholes here and there, but um, basically people are pretty much convinced that, that um, that's a legitimate uh, a factorization theorem at this point. Um, and so um, basically later to make the analogy with jets, let me first discuss um, hadron production. And so um, if we're interested here um, by basically measuring hadrons with large transverse momentum, also differential, say, in the rapidity, then the way we can write down a factorization theorem is in terms of partial distribution functions, um, hard scattering cross sections, and fragmentation functions. And so only the, the perturbative hard function is, of course, what we're going to compute uh, perturbatively, whereas these um, non perturbative inputs that we need, so basically how to find uh, in this PP question here, a part on A and B inside the proton. Um, and then basically we have a fragmentation function telling us how the parton turns into a hadron here in the final state. These are non-perturbative um, and we have to extract them from data. Um, but we do know perturbatively how they change with energy. So we know that they satisfy big lab evolution equations. Um, and then we can do global analysis and extract them from certain reference processes and use them to make predictions for others. 
And so you can see here two examples. Um, this is a PDF site. Um, <clears throat> and you can see here an extraction of um, uh, basically, in this case, a gluon to pion um, fragmentation function um, that can be extracted, for example, at fixed order at next to next to leading order um, at, at this point. Um, and so now basically the question is how can we extend this um, to jets? Of course, I should say this is really a non-trivial statement because in general you can have interactions between um, the spectators here, for example, or between the spectators in the hard part and so on and so forth. So, so these kind of statements about factorization are of course highly non-trivial and, and difficult to prove um, to, to all orders. Okay, so here's the honor of my, for the rest of my talk. I'll first um, discuss a little bit of aspects um, of EIC jet physics. Um, that are sort of to, to contrast them a little bit to LHC physics, where a lot of the progress has been made over the last years. Um, then I'll talk about the perturbative QCD calculations, um, sort of the very basics, and then um, I'll go get back to um, different applications um, um, at the EIC. Okay, so the EIC, um, to highlight a little bit where jets sort of come in, the EIC. Um, is of course an experiment that will have very high luminosity and will have a thousand times that of HERA. It will have a range of center of mass energy um, between 20 and 140 GeV. Um, and here you can sort of see the timeline with the different uh, important uh, um, events um, um, up till now. So starting with the INT program, the white paper, then the, the um, CD0, CD1, the critical decisions um, to actually build the EIC. Uh, and then you have here um, also 2021, um, the uh, yellow report um, for, for the EIC. And so the reason I bring this up is because is that kind of interestingly in, in both of these 2010, 2015, um, like jets were not really mentioned um, in, in these documents as sort of the fit to make the physics case for the EIC. And so in this sense, it's really kind of a new component of the EIC because now uh, in the yellow report, a lot of jet physics is actually included. And so it's really something where a lot of progress has been made basically since then, uh, since 2015, and we understand a lot better now factorization theorems and how to really um, quantitatively compute cross sections and make use of those. Um, and so really a lot sort of has changed over the last you know, uh, five, seven years or so. Um, and also to illustrate that a little bit with papers, um, basically for all um, the four pillars of the EIC science program, whether that's the proton spin and, and colonial PDFs, uh, or sort of 3D imaging of GPDs and TMDs, um, small x physics saturation, uh, hadronization studies, and um, how quarks and gluons can probe uh, sort of the cold nuclear matter environment of heavy nuclei. Um, for all of those, people basically write a lot of papers now that include jet, jet physics or that are specifically dedicated to, to, to jet physics. And that's really something that sort of appeared over, over the last years. And I think besides just um, sort of helping the existing science program, um, there are also a lot of interesting questions um, that can only be really addressed with JETS. And so it's really extending it in, I think, in a, in a unique way. And I'll show several examples of those uh, later in my talk. Um, now, when we think about jet physics at DIC, one of course has to be kind of careful about it because we're at much lower energies than at the LHC. And I think that to some extent was sort of a reason that, that also that it, it wasn't considered as much before, because if you look at just, for example, the transverse momentum here that's measured at Atlas, um, which is actually some old data at ATV, um, you see that these jets actually have energies that go all the way up to two TV and, and even beyond. Um, so they really carry a significant fraction of the total um, center of mass energy and you can you know, reliably construct them and you're also specifically often interested in sort of this high PT tail. Um, whereas if, if you look now at the LHC, uh, sorry, the EIC, um, and you look again at the transverse momentum of, part of, uh, of jets um, that we expect to see there, then um, you see that this is the same uh, uh, units here. So it's all also in GeV and you can basically see it just goes up to something like 40 GeV and then uh, you very quickly run out of steam. So you will have very, very weak uh, jets with very, very low transverse momentum um, compared to the LHC. So the physics that you're after um, can, of course, be very different. One has to be very careful to sort of use jets not exactly necessarily in the same way. Um, so that's basically, I would say, two, two things in general. One is sort of the low energy of jets. So one has to worry, for example, about um, hadronization corrections. So even though, for example, observables might be infrared colonial safe, because they're at so low energies, we may have to worry about hadronization corrections, or we can specifically study those. 
Um, but on the other hand, um, if you compare, for example, the entire envir environment at these collisions. So here on the left, you see like a typical um, uh, 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 configuration at Atlas uh, with like many jets and there's really a lot of stuff going on, you know, besides say, say if you would just want to look at a particular jet, right, you have to basically worry about the entire event and that can basically mess up, you know, your jet calculation or your jet observable. So it's kind of a really messy environment versus um, this is a simulated collision here at the EIC, you see the scattered um, lepton, there's, you know, one uh, relatively high PT jet and there's a bunch of other stuff, but it's really not a whole lot going on in these collisions. So um, that is really something that is like an advantage. We have a very clean environment compared to the LHC. I'll make that a little bit more um, quantitative what I mean by clean environment, um, but that really is an advantage. So even though we're at very low energies, um, we do have a very clean environment and that is, um, allows us to still do jet measurements, but the physics that, that we need to understand very well to do these measurements, um, that can actually be very different. And so one has to always like keep that in, in mind. Um, the same is basically, if you look at, um, or another way to, to think about this is to basically uh, look at the number of particles that you have in the jet. Um, at the LHC, of course, you have more, but here, um, this is again plotted here, the number of jet constituents plotted as a function of the transverse momentum. So it only goes up to 30 in that particular plot, but anyway, illustrates the point. Um, so what you can see in black is the total number of particles. So whatever particle that is. Um, and you can see this increases as a function of the jet energy. And so if we're here very, the very high end jet PT tail over here, um, we have up to on average something like 10 particles, um, maybe up to 12. Um, if, if we actually push this maybe a little bit further, but then that's, that's about it. So we have order 10 particles. Um, and then you can sort of you know, uh, split that up into different uh, types of particles. And that's of course gonna be less. Um, if of course we wanna measure, for example, jets at these low momenta, then uh, that of course can be a problem. So if, if I wanna measure a jet that only contains two particles, well, then I'm not really, then, then I will definitely run into problems um, by still calling that a jet. So um, while of course in all these calculations, like no one, like in, in these perturbative calculations, it doesn't basically tell me um, if where I should place a cut here. So it's not really clear, can I still call a jet, uh, um, can I still call an object a jet um, if I have five particles in it or 10? Um, so that's not really clear, but one basically has to do computations and understand the theory uncertainties to really sort of make that quantitative. Um, but it's definitely something to keep in mind. If you push to very low PT, if you go to very extreme kinematics, very forward, for example, um, then one really has to be very careful um, to, to talk about jets because very few particles can, can really be a problem. Um, but there's definitely a lot of room to do jet physics. Um, and again, one has this very clean environment um, and that really uh, allows you to do jet physics in a, in a very interesting way. Now, I still wanted to make a bit more point of what I mean by clean environment. So when we see these types of collisions here at the LHC, um, there's really a lot going on. And so to illustrate a little bit um, what these different contributions are, um, let me uh, go through this, this figure here on the right, trying to illustrate that. So we have basically a PP collisions um, coming in at very high energies. Then we have a hard scattering event, um, which is uh, shown here in black. And then I have basically final state radiation of that struck quark um, that produces here, or quark or gluon that produces this final state jet that I observe. Um, and if I just want to look at basically one jet and measure for example, it's inclusive PT spectrum um, or some jet substructure observable, then there will be a lot of other things that also contribute. And so one of the things um, is, for example, the initial state radiation. So I have here the, the incoming uh, protons that um, can, of course, emit particles. Um, sometimes they're power suppressed, so it depends on the observable, but they can be irrelevant. Um, relatively difficult to deal with. Um, more difficult even to deal with are the underlying event. So in one PP collision, I can have multiple in, uh, interactions um, that can also emit, especially soft particles um, that can basically um, uh, uh, end up here in the jet. And that's not covered if I just look at the final state radiation and do that computation. Um, and I can even have in a single bunch crossing, I can have multiple PP interactions. Um, so they can be basically di uh, somewhat dislocated, um, but it's very difficult sometimes to separate those in these complex environments. So this pileup um, can also contribute. And so it's also something that has to worry about. It of course depends on the observable that we're looking at. If we're just looking at the transverse momentum spectrum, then a lot of these things can be corrected for, but especially the high luminosity LAC that can be a problem, um, especially if you look at things like jet substructure.
um, versus at the EIC, we don't really have to worry about any of these things. Um, there will be some initial state radiation, um, but it's, it, that's really under control. Uh, the underlying event and pileup are basically gone. And so in that sense, uh, it will be a, a simpler environment in that sense. Um, and, and that can, one can basically make use of that fact. Okay, so, but if we are at these very low energies, um, one basically still has to ask the question, um, whether jets are still good proxies of particle level kinematics. So that's what I pointed out at the beginning that was sort of uh, the motivation um, to look at jets specifically is because using jets, we have a very good proxy for working gluon degrees of freedom. And that's basically what we want to access at the EIC to understand nucleons nuclei in terms of particle level degrees of freedom. Um, and so one of course has to check, is that still the case um, at these low energies? It's definitely the case you know, at the LHC, but, but does it still work at the EIC at these low energies? And so what we're looking at here are jets sort of in this like reasonable PT range of say um, 10 uh, to 30 GeV. And we try to, to do some um, simulations uh, to understand this better um, here with, with Pythia. So what we're looking at is um, basically the leading order DIS process here shown in the middle where we have an electron scattering off uh, a nucleon or say uh, the struck quark. And then uh, what we're looking at um, is the scattered electron here and the struck quark. And so of course, in reality, you don't have access to this, but you do have access to it in, in simulations like Pythia. We can say exactly where the struck quark kinematics are. We can check if that actually matches well with the jet that we eventually identify. And so to illustrate this, uh, we make these um, uh, plots here on the left where um, these 2D histograms and, and these polar plots where we record um, in histogram the kinematics of the scattered electron in the upper half plane and the struck quark in uh, the lower half plane. And so what you can see here on the radial component is basically the um, absolute value of the three momentum of the particles. And then you basically have here the rapidity um, uh, backward and forward. And here you have basically the beam sort of in, in, in the center. Um, so this is this, the scattered electron and this is the struck quark. So that's basically what we would like to have. Um, but of course, just identifying the struck quark, that's not what we do in experiments. So we actually have to run the full simulation, then um, include basically target remnants, underlying event. Um, we have to run the, the entire shower, of course, and then do hadronization. And so um, then for basically the same uh, kinematics, we plot again uh, here in the center, the same distribution, um, but now at hadron level. So that's basically full event simulation. So the, the struck electron or the, the scattered electron basically doesn't change, but this lower distribution in the lower half plane, of course, changes dramatically. So if we just look at hadrons here in the final state, um, we're really far away now from this distribution um, uh, that we actually wanted to reconstruct. So the struck quark and the hadron distribution is very different. Um, and so that's basically where now jets can come in. And so we run, in addition, so we run the full event simulation. In addition to that, now we run as a third step, we run uh, the jet uh, reconstruction algorithm. And what we end up then is this figure here on the right. Um, where you can see here in red, that's the distribution of jets. And now this one here, as opposed to this one, really corresponds very nicely to the struck quark distribution here on the left. Um, and that basically means that even though, of course, the asymptotic states of QCD are hadrons, but if we group them together according to a certain jet algorithm, we can actually almost, per, or not, not almost perfectly, but we can get a very good proxy um, for particle level kinematics that we actually want to see here on, on, on the left. And so for that, even though these energies here are very low compared to the LHC, um, this still works actually really, really well. Um, there's another thing I wanted to point out in these plots um, that jets sort of provide naturally is a separation of um, the so-called current and target fragmentation region. So the current region is basically um, anything associated with the struck quark. Um, so that's here, the jet distribution over here. And then it's the target fragmentation region or anything that sort of goes down the beam pipe. And that's, um, of course, shown here um, basically close to, to the beam axis over here. And these are basically all um, these, these red points uh, and these jets that you sort of see here um, um, uh, close to the beam axis. And, and sort of the important point is that they're very cleanly separated here um, from the current fragmentation region. Um, and so you basically can just separate that by eye versus if you look here at the hadron distribution, um, that's completely merged together, right? Like it's very hard to basically look at um, these hadrons, especially in this where you have the most hadrons here in this sort of 
low energy region, it's very hard to, to um, identify these two regions. You definitely can't do that by eye. And so you have to you know, look at the calculations and see what does it work or it doesn't. Um, and so it's much, much more difficult to basically separate these two regions versus if you look at jets, you basically uh, get, that, get that for free. And so these are basically the two ingredients um, or the two takeaways from the study is that one, um, jets are still excellent proxies at these um, at, at EIC energies. And uh, we can have this very clean separation of these two fragmentation regions. Okay, so the question I want to address uh, then in sort of the next part of my talk is to, to basically get a theory understanding um, of why jets are so good proxies of parton level kinematics compared to adults. Um, I mean, we see that here in the simulation, but it would be good to have sort of a, a, a good theory understanding of why that is. And so with that, let me come to um, perturbative QCD calculations uh, and back to, to factorization theorems. Um, so this is what I showed before. This is the factorization for hadrons um, where I had to introduce two PDFs, a hard function, and then a fragmentation function that tells me how the parton turns into a hadron. And now, as it turns out, um, if I want to think about jet production, then I can pretty much keep the same uh, formulas uh, as up here. And if I want to now look at jets, all I really have to do is I have to switch out these non-perturbative um, parton to hadron transition functions, the fragmentation functions, with perturbative um, jet functions so they can compute uh, purely perturbatively. Um, but everything else is basically the same. So the jet function also now just tells me how does a parton turn into a jet as opposed to a hadron. And that transition is something that I can compute just perturbatively. So the only two uh, non-perturbative components I have here in the lower equation is well just the two PDFs. Okay, so what does this jet function look like? Um, and <clears throat> so what you can see here, so what one can really think of it as a fragmentation function, but for jets. Um, so it's somehow like a, no, it's not really a probability distribution, it's like a number density, but still gives us sort of a, a probability of to, to find um, a jet with a given momentum fraction Z relative to the initiating parton. And so, um, of course, then the way we want to look at this is a function of the momentum fraction z that's contained in the jet that I observe compared to the initiating uh, initial parton. And so this is written here as uh, this variable z, which is really the exact same thing as a fragmentation function variable z um, that I want to know how much momentum is contained or how much energy is contained uh, in the hadron. And now we're looking at the energy contained in the jet with a given radius and with a given jet algorithm that I'll get back to later. Um, and so the important thing that one can see here, so I'll, I'll show you some, some equations later, but let me first to get some intuition, um, show you uh, the numerical results. And so what you can see is that this distribution here peaks at very large values of Z. Um, so this is of course for a fixed radius. So if I choose a typical radius, say 0.7, then I find this large um, peak here at large values of Z. And that basically means that it's very likely that I find a jet that contains pretty much all the initial energy um, that I had at the beginning. And this is now for gluon jets. If I look at quark jets, it's actually even more peaked at large values of Z. And that basically tells us, um, that basically comes back to the, the question that I had on, uh, a couple of slides ago. It's like, what, why are they so good proxies? Well, they're so good proxies because it's very likely that in my jet, I have pretty much all the energy that was initially available in um, the QCD fragmentation process. Um, and so this is, of course, as I mentioned, it's not a probability distribution, it's a number density. And so, because I look at basically inclusive jets, um, so I count every jet that I find and I put them in, you know, in, a, in a histogram, I'll not just produce one jet, but I produce a bunch of jets. So I'll produce very likely one jet that contains a large fraction of the energy, of like 0.9. And then I will here, um, I get another peak basically at small values of Z, um, where I basically then produce a, a bunch of like softer jets. Um, but there will basically be one jet, one uh, highly energetic jet that is this very good proxy um, for uh, my parton level kinematics. And then I have a bunch of softer stuff as well. And so I can, again, compare that to a fragmentation function. This is what I showed you before. This is some, this next, next leading order extraction. And what you can see here um, for the gluon, I'm going to pions. This very different than this peak structure over here, the gluon fragmentation function basically just drops off um, towards zero. And meaning it's very unlikely that I'm gonna find a pion or basically any hadron um, that will contain pretty much all the energy that was initially available from the gluon that I started with. 
And that leads to these very different um, patterns that we found in these polar plots. So the hadrons give you something like this, the sort of the energy is spread out into multiple hadrons um, all over the event, versus if I look at jets, then I'll definitely find one jet um, that, that will have pretty much all the initial available energy and that makes them so, so good proxies. So if we can use jets, that is a very good thing to do because it gives us very good access to parton level kinematics. Now, um, one can still connect the two actually a little more. Um, so what we can do is basically we can lower um, the jet radius. So here I use something that's relatively large or I could make it even larger. But <coughs> if, you, if you intuitively imagine if I make my jet radius smaller and smaller, eventually I should actually recover the hadron distribution, right? If I basically choose my radius to be zero, then our, every jet will basically be just a single hadron, right? And so that one would sort of intuitively expect that as somehow a smooth transition um, between the two, a transition that of course has to be not perturbative eventually, um, but you would sort of expect um, that it eventually approximates a fragmentation function. Um, and as it turns out, one can actually make that quantitative. And so um, if you basically lower your radius, as you can see here, this peak slowly disappears. Um, and that peak which disappears is basically compensated for by an enhancement here in um, the small Z region, meaning it's much more likely that if I make my radius smaller, I will basically split up that large jet into many smaller jets and um, they will carry just a small momentum fraction. So I get this increase here in small Z. And so in principle, if I would be able to lower my radius down to zero, I should basically get a hadron fragmentation function. That's sort of the analogy. And it turns out actually one can make that um, uh, quantitative, which I'll, I'll get back to the, at the very end of my my talk. Okay, so this is these are numerical results. Um, what does it actually look like um, uh, when I try to do a computation? And so, of course, we have to work in by order by order in perturbation theory. And so, um, well, these functions are typically uh, or often referred to in the literature as semi-inclusive jet functions because they're sort of inclusive. Um, but so, what what they basically measure is the energy or the transverse momentum that is contained in the jet relative to the initial parton. And so let's take a look at leading order. Next leading order, at leading order, of course, is trivial. Whatever energy I start with, there's just one parton, that's going to be the jet. Doesn't matter what jet algorithm I use, um, perturbatively, if I just have one, any algorithm will give me the same result. And um, perturbatively, if I then look at the result um, for the jet function, now for the core case, um, then I can write that, of course, in terms of momentum fraction Z that's still in the jet. And that's, of course, one here. So I'll just get a delta function at leading order. So that's, that's kind of trivial. Um, so let's take a look at next leading order. And so at next leading order, I will have a highly energetic parton I start with, and I can split into two. I also have these virtual corrections. I have virtual corrections um, that are, of course, also going to be proportional to a delta function. But then in general, if I have a parton branching process, um, then these partons can either be clustered into the same jet, then my mental fraction is still going to be one that's going to be contained in the jet, or they can be um, sufficiently far separated that they're identified as separate jets. And that will then give a non-trivial functional dependence on Z, and that eventually gives the jet function that you saw in the previous slide. Um, so let's take a look what that looks like, specifically for the anti-KT algorithm, if I have um, this kind of splitting here um, at next to leading order. I have a splitting function that gives me my uh, uh, momentum fraction Z. Um, I have a transverse momentum relative to initial parton. And then I basically need to look at the opening angle between the two. And then I need to apply the anti-KT criterion whenever that angle beta here is larger, uh, sorry, smaller than the jet radius R, um, then I will put them into a single jet. So in this case here on the left, if they're sufficiently separated, then I basically reconstruct them as separate jets. And so I'll take both of them independent of the value of Z, right? That basically what it means to be inclusive um, as opposed to say a leading jet, that would be very different. Um, and this angle beta here is basically given by, by that equation here in terms of momentum fraction and transverse momentum and the initially available energy. And so then if I wanna compute the jet function, what I have to do is have to write down uh, an next leading order, uh, say my, um, phase space here um, for two particles in the final state and the colonial matrix element squared, which is basically the splitting function. Um, and then I need to integrate that here against my jet algorithm constraint. And my jet algorithm constraint is basically what I, what I wrote up here. So I would write down um, basically the phase space and the colonial matrix element. Um, we can derive that in soft effective theory and, and 
can see more details over here, but it's, it's really independent of the soft collinear effective theory treatment. Um, and where I get uh, the matrix element squared is here, just the um, splitting function. And then I have to integrate here against that um, uh, jet algorithm uh, constraint. And I'll, I'll get some contributions that will still be proportional to the delta function, one minus z, and I will get some non-trivial functional dependence on z as well. Um, OK. And um, that's basically what you can see here. So if you then basically group all the terms together, um, the jet function that you're going to end up with is um, at next leading order for the anti-KT algorithm is, is this result here. Um, so what, what can we see here? So it's again the leading order contribution that you saw before. Then there's a term, um, or basically everything else, is going to be proportional to alpha s, of course. Um, there's a couple of different terms here, but it's actually not too long. So um, the first one that we can see is basically a logarithm in the jet radius. So generally, this function is going to depend on z. It's going to depend on the scale q um, in combined with uh, multiplied by the jet radius. So that's basically this quantity here. And then it will depend on a scale mu. Um, and so that, that's basically this logarithm here. And which, as you can see here, is basically multiplied by the algebraic Parisi splitting functions. And so this is sort of the effective field theory language. Um, one could also rephrase that a little bit. but um, the way one can think about it here is that um, I can choose that scale mu to basically remove the large logarithm. So I can basically choose it um, to be q times r. Then I basically remove this log completely. And so I don't have to worry anymore whether that's a large contribution. Um, so even though alpha s is small, this large this log can be large, and then I have to like worry about those. Um, and so as it turns out, you can basically see here this is multiplied by the um, splitting functions. This entire jet function or combined with the gluon will satisfy um, D club evolution equations. So pretty much in the same way as a fragmentation function does, um, except that I have a different starting scale. So for a fragmentation function, I would start say at one GeV or wherever I kind of parameterize um, my fragmentation function and then evolve it. Here, I would basically set the starting scale by whatever I choose here to eliminate the large log. So basically here, I'm gonna choose as my starting scale, the scale of Q times R. Um, and then I'm going to have to evolve that with DGLAB, that entire jet function or quark and gluon together, up to the hard scale Q. And so by doing that, I basically with some logarithms of the ratio of these two quantities, and the ratio of these is, of course, just the logarithm uh, of the jet radius R itself. Um, and so by basically writing down a jet function, by solving the re associated renormalization group equation, I can resum logarithms in the jet radius. And then I can combine that um, with uh, the factorization. So this is the factorization you saw before, the two PDFs, a hard function, which sits at scale Q, um, or say PT um, for a transverse momentum jet. And then I basically convolve that result with the evolved jet function over here. So I can basically just do a one-to-one -one, um, mapping. If I have a code that produces me an inclusive hadron spectrum, take out the fragmentation function, and I can replace it with the evolved um, jet function. Um, and then that will give me a jet cross section as opposed to a hadron cross section. But it's really um, basically a one to one co correspondence. Um, so there's still additional logarithms one can worry about. As you can see, there's, this is one logarithm only, but there's two more logarithms. There's a small z logarithm and a threshold logarithm um, that one also has to uh, potentially worry about. And so for the threshold logarithm, one can do additional threshold resummation, join threshold resummation. That's actually what I included here in all those figures before. And then there's still a small z logarithm that one also has to worry about. Um, so this one is a double logarithmic series. The logs and r is a single logarithmic series as is typical for DGLAB. This is a double logarithmic series. So um, one has to be, of course, careful that there's no um, crosstalk between them when one does a joint resummation, but it's something that can be done. Um, the small z resummation is quite a bit more complicated. Um, and I'll only get back to that um, again at the end of my talk. Um, let me just quickly ask, is, is there, should, there be a break at some point or um... if, if you wish you you can have a break like like uh, five minutes break okay okay um, it, it, it's it's up it's up to you I, I think i mean i can i can also continue either either way yeah okay yeah okay okay uh, I'll, I'll continue if that's okay um okay so so in that sense um this basically gives us I would say a very intuitive way of thinking about jets because it has this very close connection uh, between jet production and hadron production um, where 
I basically just have to switch out you know, the transition function for part time to hadron or part time to jet. But of course, we still need to show that actually works well phenomenologically. Um, there's no data, of course, at the EIC, but we do can compare to, to LHC data. And as I just very briefly to illustrate that it does work. Um, what you can see here is specifically the jet radius dependence, right? So that basically addresses these type of logs that need to be resumed. And um, what CMS measured here is specifically the jet cross section as a function um, of the jet radius. And so it, it took some ratios and so on. And, and you can see here in, in orange the results. Um, this is a ratio to the data, and you can see the orange result um, uh, agrees here actually perfectly um, with, with the data. Um, and, and so, of course, if you go to, to EIC energies, it's going to be lower energies, right? And so one really has to make sure we use the correct theoretical framework um, to do these computations where alpha s is going to be larger, potentially, right, and, and or will be larger. Uh, and so we have to make sure we have the, the, the correct theoretical framework that gives a very good and precise uh, uh, description of the data. And so this is not just an intuitive framework to think about jets, but it also really gives a very good agreement, which at least if you if you did certain fixed order calculations, that that, that could be a problem. Um, so one thing I wanted to point out, um, sort of as a first aspect of, of EIC jet physics, is um, that, uh, and I unfortunately don't have it here, but before I, I showed you basically this PT spectrum, that falls very steeply um, if you go to very high if you try to measure jets with very high transverse momentum, if you want to identify two TEB jet, right, the cross section for that is going to be very low. Um, and so sort of the unfortunate thing of that, um, of having sort of um, it being only able to measure basically the final uh, 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 jet transverse momentum, but not having access to the initial scale, that basically always gives you these distributions that fall over many orders of magnitude. Um, but of course, but as I, as I showed you here, these jet functions actually have a peak, right, at large values of Z. And um, so if you basically look at um, <coughs> LHC jets, then um, you sort of don't see that peak structure, right? There's no peak structure at large values, right, of Z or PT, right? It's just falling very steeply. And the reason is that you still integrate in the factorization that jet function against the heart function. And that heart function falls very steeply. And you basically have to integrate over the entire thing because you don't know what the initial scale was, right? You basically integrate over the initial part on momentum, you have to integrate over all allowed values. So in that sense, you're basically not sensitive um, to sort of this transition happening and you're only sensitive to the integral of all these things. And so at the EIC, we can actually see the peak structure directly because we're able to construct observables um, where we have access to the initial scale. So I have an initial scale Q, and then I can measure my jet energy at the end, and then I should actually see a peak structure, right? Otherwise, I sort of have to integrate over that initial scale and PP quotients. And so in, in, in EP quotients, I can construct um, such an initial scale, which is basically set by the photon virtuality Q. I can go to the bright frame, uh, use a certain jet algorithm, and then I just measure the jet energy as similar to basically E plus C minus quotients, where I can also do something uh, similar. Um, I just measure the jet energy as opposed to say a transverse momentum or a transverse energy. And then I can actually um, uh, produce here a cross section in as a function of the jet energy sort of rescaled, so sort of, um, the Z values between zero and one. Um, and then I can actually look at this entire distribution and actually see a, a real peak structure, which is what we would expect from these jet functions. And so one can actually construct um, these types of observables um, in EP collisions or whenever I have leptons in the initial state, right, that gives me sort of access to an additional reference scale um, versus in PP collisions, I, I don't really have that. And so that I would say is sort of one of the advantages um, that we'll be able to do these kind of measurements at the EIC in EP collisions. We can also you know, look at some of these things at HERA uh, where we can actually measure this kind of peak structure of the jets and see it sort of directly in the data, which would not be possible um, at the LHC or or generally in PP collisions and sort of smeared over. Um, and that of course also is then a starting point if I wanna and I get back to that later, if I wanna um, study uh, TMDs with jet physics, then um, I will also uh, uh, basically do these kind of measurements and then you know, do additional measurements besides the jet energy. Okay, so um, next I wanted to talk a little bit about jet substructure and so Jet substructure is, again, a topic that sort of evolved over the last um, decade or so, where we're not just interested in basically saying, you know, there's a jet with a given energy in a given uh, direction, but we actually want to look inside the jet and measure and analyze or use to some extent 
um, the radiation pattern that you find in these jets. And so I'm trying to illustrate that here in these two figures on the left, you can see basically a single jet, a single QCD jet. Um, as I mentioned briefly before, um, the energy in this case is predominantly centered sort of at the core of the jet. Um, and if I average over multiple or, or, or many jets, um, then I actually find this distribution here on the right, where um, now this is sort of, of course, nicely um, and smooth because I just averaged over many. Uh, and you see that at the core of the jet, um, I basically have a lot of energy. And then uh, toward the edge, it sort of dies off pretty quickly. And there's really not that much anymore. Um, and so now what we basically want to do is we want to measure, for example, um, the transverse momentum distribution, right? Relative, for example, the jet axis, we can measure the longitudinal distribution, or we can measure the jet mass or whatever, right? There's like many different um, jet substructure absorbables one, one can think of. And I want to show basically one, one example. So if you want to do jet substructure measurements and, and, and do calculations for that, we also always now basically have to answer two questions um, simultaneously. So we always need to know basically what's the momentum fraction contained in the jet. That's basically like the jet function that I talked about before, where we need to know relative to what we had at the beginning, at part on level, what do we have now in the jet? So we need to know its energy. And then we basically need to make a second measurement. So we need to be double differential and also, for example, know what's the mass of the jet or what's the Hadron distribution in the jet. And so basically always have to then do double differential calculations. Um, and of course, depending on which observable I'm looking at, I'll be sensitive to very different scales. So before I was basically, like if my jet was basically a single scale object, right? Because I just measure the transverse momentum. If my jet is large, then that's just a single scale. But if I look at basically jet substructure and depending on which observables I'm looking at, I'll be sensitive to um, sort of like different scales in sort of the shower evolution. Um, and then potentially depending on what I measure, I can also be sensitive to hadronization itself. Uh, in which case that's of course not IRC safe anymore and I have to introduce uh, non-perturbative components. Um, and so to give uh, an, uh, an example of, of, of how to do these kind of calculations, as I mentioned, we always need to have two observables now, um, but there's actually not that much that changes at first in the factorization. So if I wanna write down now a cross-section differential, um, not only in the jet kinematics, rapidity and transverse momentum, but I also want to know, for example, that jet mass. So it's a triple differential cross section. What I need to do is still, I need to include two PDF, a hard function that is convolved in this variable Z in the energy fraction Z with the jet function that depends on Z. Um, and then I have basically this additional variable tau um, that up to leading power really just appears here in uh, the jet function itself. So I can keep basically everything as it is. And I just need to compute a new jet function that now basically has uh, uh, two quantities measured about the finite state radiation. Um, and so I want to give one example, not of the jet mass, but the distribution of hadrons um, in the jet, because that's something um, that, that has you know, uh, certain applications at the EIC. And so what we want to measure um, is this cross section here, differential on jet kinematics. And then in addition, we measure this momentum fraction, the longitudinal momentum fraction, ZH, which is defined here. So we have a given jet, and then we measure um, the, um, just the momentum fraction that they identified particular hadron here. We don't care about where it is, but we just care about what's the momentum fraction um, of the hadron relative to uh, the jet momentum. So, so PT here in both cases relative to um, the beam axis. So it's where just like the energy of the transverse momentum um, of the hadron that I have in the jet. And so what we need to do in this case, and it's pretty much the same for any other observable, I have to write down a jet function in the literature that's typically referred to as um, curly G as opposed to J, whenever it's double differential or triple differential, uh, I basically uh, will always use this curly G because that's what's used in literature. Um, and so what we then have to do is basically do a double differential calculation. Um, the result in that particular case is shown here. Um, we have a leading order contribution that now has two delta functions. And this is the next leading order um, contribution. And you see here a couple of terms that we saw before. So for example, this lower line here, the Z dependence is just this exact same thing as in the jet function that I showed before. Now it's just multiplied by an additional delta function. Um, and then I have here some non-trivial um, functional dependence on ZH, which is the, the, the new variable uh, at that order. Um, there's also the log in the jet radius that we were summed just as before. Um, and then there's here this additional term, which is uh, still has a singularity 
So um, here, of course, we cannot do a purely perturbative calculation because we're observing hadrons in the final state or hadrons in the jet. And so what we're going to do then is um, to basically effectively absorb that by matching onto a collinear fragmentation function. So we'll take that jet function and compute basically a matching coefficient um, with a regular collinear fragmentation function. All that it does is basically it removes the singularity and then I'm going to uh, compute the convolution integral of that thing here with a fragmentation function. And so that's basically uh, all, all, all there is. So it's, it's, it's really relatively simple uh, prescriptions uh, to, to do um, jet substructure calculations starting from that initial formula. And so just to confirm again that this actually works uh, phenomenologically, um, you can see here some data uh, in, and, and compared uh, to, to, to some of, of these calculations. Um, so what this is again, LHC data um, for a range of trans, uh, transverse momentum, uh, trans, transverse momenta of the jet, uh, ranging from 45 up to 260 um, GeV of, of the jet. And then you measure basically the, the longitudinal um, hadron distribution in the jet. And you can see here a comparison. So these of course fall very steeply here as a function of um, ZH, meaning it's very unlikely you find a hadron um, that contains uh, a, uh, basically the entire energy of the, the jet that you're looking at. And so a typical fragmentation spectrum is just falls up very steeply toward one. Um, and that you know, gives a pretty good agreement. And then uh, later I'll show some predictions also. And for the EIC, where of course we'll have a lot less hadrons, but we can still basically look at their energy distribution, the longitudinal and also their transverse energy distribution in, inside that jet. Okay. So, um, now, let me come to the last part of my talk, um, which is specifically about applications using this, this framework of perturbation theory and trying to apply it as good as we can to um, jets uh, at uh, these low energies um, at the EIC. Um, and so I want to cover um, a few topics, um, partly sort of these 3D imaging things, so TMDs and GPDs, the other things heard about also here at this um, summer school, um, then that is sort of anyway part of the, the, um, the, the EIC program and sort of how JETS can help uh, potentially in that direction. Um, and then I'll talk a bit about other things such as um, JET grooming, which are sort of independent of that. Um, and then at the very end, I'll, I'll still want to talk uh, or at least briefly mention how we can actually um, do calculations of hadrons um, now knowing all these things about JETS. Um, which, which sort of we didn't know before and how that can change even calculations we do for hadrons. Okay, so if we want to think about 3D imaging, of course, that means um, we want to go beyond sort of the collinear fragmentation or the collinear um, PDF picture, and we want to measure things like TMDs or um, GPDs. And the traditional way, I'll only talk about TMDs here, and the traditional way and the standard observable um, uh, um, and that, of course, will continue to be that is, is of course, at, in, in EP scattering is semi-inclusive um, deep and elastic scattering where we measure um, not just the energy of a hadron, but we basically also measure its um, small transverse momentum um, as it's illustrated here uh, in, in this figure. So we basically are in this TMD region where we have our large scale set by Q squared and we have a small scale, which is the transverse momentum. Um, and then we have basically a large hierarchy in this TMD region. Now, if you do these type of measurements, um, one of sort of the important things is when you want to extract in a global analysis, um, like the relevant quantities, then um, the way to do this um, is basically by in introducing both TMD PDFs and TMD fragmentation functions. And both of those will basically contribute um, to the total transverse momentum that you're going to observe. Um, <clears throat> and so, basically both of those have to contribute. Um, and so if I do a global analysis, I need to extract both simultaneously. And so here, um, jet physics can basically provide a way, a complementary, a complementary way uh, of doing this, where um, I'm basically only sensitive to either TMD PDFs or just TMD fragmentation functions. So jet physics basically allows you um, to separate out these, um, these different contributions. And then you can basically study them more in isolation as opposed to you know, having to combine them together. And so let me illustrate how that can be done. Um, first, let's look at TMD PDFs. What I can measure um, is, for example, um, basically if I look at the leading order um, uh, lepton quark scattering process, 
I can measure the outgoing jet and I can basically look at how it recoils against the, the um, final state scattered electron. So as illustrated here, so I have a jet, I measure its transverse momentum, I measure the electron transverse momentum, and then I basically look at the sum of the two. So again, I have a TMD situation, I have a hard scale, PT of the jet or the electron, and then I have a small scale, which is QT, um, and that basically, if I look at this imbalance near the back-to-back -back region, I'm basically sensitive to TMD PDFs. I can do the entire thing in the polarized case. So if I polarize my initial proton, um, then there can be a spin correlation, um, and I can basically be sensitive to, to the sivers. The interesting thing is, if you do the calculation, um, you find that there's no TMD uh, basically in the final state. So because the, the jet is basically transverse, um, like there's a soft function that, that doesn't come sort of in the back-to-back -back region. And that basically means that um, there's no TMD sensitivity in uh, the final state. And that means if I look at this cross-section, I'm really just sensitive to a TMD PDF and nothing else. And so I can basically look at this in isolation. And um, here we made some uh, projections and predictions for the EIC. You can see the current theory uncertainty of current extractions is really large. The expected precision at the EIC is very small. And so we expect that we can really very well constrain uh, these type of distributions, these non perturbed distributions in a global analysis using, using jet data. That's one way of doing it. So basically, um, the important aspect of this process is that we look at um, lepton jet or electron jet production in the bright, uh, sorry, in the lab frame, uh, where they're basically back to back. Um, one can do this in a somewhat different way uh, by looking at the bright frame. Um, so this is work here by Walter Balivine and, and collaborators. Um, where they do it in a different way. You actually have to use a different jet algorithm for this. Um, this can be done with a regular KT algorithm. Here you have to basically cluster and angles. Um, but it's very similar here um, to the way you would normally measure um, CITES uh, with hadrons. So you basically look at the very small KT or QT, uh, the way it's written here, of the jet um, relative uh, here to, the, to this direction. Um, and then you measure similar, exact same thing that you would normally measure with hadrons. So you measure Q squared X and Z, and then a small um, QT basically. And it turns out in this case, very similar to um, the uh, hadron cities, you find a factorization that involves both a TMD PDF and a TMD fragmentation part, but instead of a non-perturbative um, TMD fragmentation in the final state, um, so this is basically a convolution in QT, um, this final state can actually be computed purely perturbatively. So it has a basically a light cone singularity or it has a TMD singularity. Um, and so you do your usual CSS evolution and all that, but you can actually compute that perturbatively. So you're never gonna hit basically lambda QCD because um, it's purely perturbatively and it's basically cut off um, by the jet radius. So also in that way, um, you can basically get rid of the TMD fragmentation function. You can compute that part purely perturbatively and you have again a cross section that is only sensitive um, to uh, the uh, TMD PDF. And so that can make uh, global analysis and all these things uh, a lot easier to extract these type of uh, distributions. Um, so these are two ways uh, to basically get at TMD PDFs. Um, one can also do this uh, with TMD um, fragmentation functions where um, as opposed to basically measuring um, hadrons. So now here was the goal of course is to measure uh, TMD P, uh, fragmentation functions for hadrons, not for jets in this case, because that's non perturbative part we're interested in. Um, and so a way to basically remove the TMD PDF in this case, as opposed to the TMD fragmentation function, is not to measure basically hadrons um, relative to some axis that's sensitive sort of to the entire event. If I do that, whenever I measure to some axis in the entire event, I will always have a sensitivity to TMD PDFs, and I you know, couldn't get rid of that. Um, but what I can do if I have a jet is basically do an the longitudinal momentum distribution basically projected onto um, the jet direction. Um, and uh, then in addition to that, we can measure the transverse momentum relative to the jet axis. So that's denoted here by this J perp. So I basically have my jet, I measure the hadrons in the jet, I measure the, the projection of their transverse momentum uh, in the, the, the jet direction and then relative um, to the jet axis. Um, and as it turns out, um, if you basically measure this in a jet as opposed to a, like the entire event, 
um, you're completely insensitive to TMD um, PDF effects at leading power in uh, the jet radius. And it turns out for any phenomenological applications, um, um, that's completely sufficient. So in that sense, we're basically, again, able to isolate um, the contribution um, from the TMD fragmentation function without simultaneously being sensitive to uh, the TMD PDF at the same time. And so in this sense, the JET basically allows you to sort of protect yourself, uh, the protect the factorization uh, to be sensitive to initial state um, TMD PDF effects. Uh, and so in that sense, that's also a very useful application. You can see here prediction um, for the uh, uh, longitudinal momentum distribution of hadrons for the transverse momentum distribution of hadrons in the JET in the unpolarized case. <coughs> One can again do the entire thing with polarization. So we can polarize your initial state proton here you know, with a transverse um, polarization. Um, and then uh, you can basically look at asymmetrical asymmetries here in the jet, basically going, this is the angle here relative um, to the reaction plane. And then basically you have an asymmetrical going around the jet axis. And that basically gives you an asymmetry. In the unpolarized case, that of course, that asymmetry around the jet axis would be zero, right? That's what you saw before in these jet substructure plots. Uh, they're completely symmetric, but if you basically polarize your initial state proton, then you can basically induce an asymmetry uh, in these, these um, you know, 2D uh, histograms of the jet substructure that, that I showed you before. And that is exactly something that can be measured. And again, um, the projections for the EIC are very small, the uncertainties are large, and, and so we'll be able to um, uh, constrain, in this case, the covalence TMD fragmentation function very well uh, with EIC data. Okay. Now, um, this was basically all um, about um, quark uh, uh, TMDs. Um, so both uh, in this case uh, and in, in the PDF case, uh, you're particularly sensitive to quarks because the leading order scattering process is what you're sensitive to here. So you look at basically lepton quark scattering, um, but you can also do the exact same thing um, by looking at two jets or by requiring there to be two jets, you can get access to um, gluon TMDs. Um, you, of course, want to make sure you get sufficiently high PT. You can do it with spin and so on and so on. So I'm not going to go into details here, but um, you can look at these papers here um, where the authors worked out the details for TMD um, PDFs for the gluon and using heavy flavor jets and all these things. And so one can also use jets here to isolate um, gluon TMDs, uh, which is, of course, very important for, for the IC science program. Okay. Now, I want to switch gears a little bit and um, talk about um, jet grooming. So um, that's really something that has developed and it's, it's really kind of separate to a large extent, at least um, from this entire like TMD, GPD uh, uh, topics and so on. It's something that has been developed at the LHC, um, partly motivated, also the question of why, uh, is because of this very complicated environment. As I mentioned before, if we're in this very complicated environment, we often have to make extra efforts to actually use um, jets. And so, um, but they're also, so at the EIC, we're not going to have that complicated environment, but there are very interesting physics that we can do with that, with that jet grooming that otherwise we wouldn't have access to. And I want to give in particular one example where I really need to have like this jet clustering history as a tool to identify very interesting observables. Um, and so in that sense, we also expect um, that this will have an important impact on EIC physics and, for example, modification in EA scattering, because, for example, at the moment, that's something that's very much discussed in heavy ion collisions. And so you want to see, for example, how uh, the jet substructure changes in, in the EI uh, electron uh, nucleus scattering environment. So what is jet grooming? Um, if this is basically supposed to illustrate a jet uh, or the jet clustering history, uh, where you have a bunch of branches that you basically put together when you, you run your jet algorithm. So that jet algorithm basically gives you such a clustering history, right? Always like these two were merged together, then this was merged with the other branch and so on, right? Um, so it basically gives you a, a clustering history that to a certain approximation approximates a parson shower structure. Um, and so the way you then basically remove soft radiation or the way you groom a jet is um, by basically recursively um, going through that clustering history and removing anything that's soft. Um, so in general, right, as I mentioned, um, there's a lot of soft physics sort of like flowing around in the event and that can end up in your jet, right? And so 
there's different ways how you can get rid of that. One way would be to just look at all the particles in the jet and removing those that are soft, right? That sort of would give you a way to identify the hard core of the jet, but that of course would be completely IRC unsafe, right? That you probably couldn't do any calculations for that. And so instead what people did, and it turns out you can do very interesting calculations with that, is to actually use the clustering history and then go backward through the clustering history. So you look at the particle that was put last into the jet and you check basically if its energy is larger than this criterion here on or this expression here on the right. So you, the energy here is Z. So what I'm trying to illustrate here is say these two um, don't satisfy. And so what is what uh, this criterion basically checks is if the energy of that branch or this branch um, is larger or smaller than this expression here on the right. Um, where, sorry, it says my internet connection is unstable. Can you, can you still hear me just to make sure? Yes. Yeah, there were some breaks, but that's now okay. Yes. Now, now it's better. Okay, sorry about that. I don't know why it's uh, suddenly bad. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, so um, this expression on the right has two components. First, it has just a threshold, um, Z cut, that you can choose as you know whatever you want, um, something like 0.1, for example. So you require that any um, branch or particle that you put on the jet has at least, then like once it passes, anything that's below, say 10%, you just remove it. Um, and you can um, then multiply that uh, uh, this this factor, this threshold, with um, an opening angle um, theta one two. It's basically the opening angle here between these two branches raised to some exponent beta. You can also set that beta to zero, for example. Then it's just a hard cut on the energy, or you can modify that and basically include here um, this angular dependence as well. Um, and then you basically just go through the history. You check the branches. Um, so this one fails, you remove it. This one fails, you remove it. But then this one here um, actually passes. And so then that will be a groom jet. So anything that's left in these two branches, that will be a groom jet. And so initially the motivation for that at the LHC was to really remove soft physics in a controlled way, in a way that you can actually compute things from first principles very well. Um, and so it, it removes soft radiation, you can compute it and it reduces non perturbative effects um, significantly. Um, so it works really well at the LHC. It's very important to do that. A lot of searches um, for physics beyond the standard model and so on use these kind of techniques to identify boosted resonances and so on. Um, what I want to focus on here, though, is that um, by looking at and studying these kind of observables, people, for example, have identified a new class of observables. Um, and that's something, even though we maybe don't care so much at the EIC about the soft background, we are definitely interested in uh, the new classes of observables because they teach us very interesting things about QCD. And so I want to specifically mention uh, the momentum sharing fraction ZG uh, that was introduced uh, here in this paper by Andrew Lakowski, Simone Marzani, and Jesse, and um, there are various papers about this. Um, and, and of course, also in heavy questions, people have looked at this quite a bit. Um, the reason it's interesting is that normally <clears throat> in QCD on perturbation theory, you think about two classes of observables, those that are IRC safe, and therefore, uh, uh, computable or calculable uh, from first principles without you know, encountering any divergences um, that, that you have to worry about and that you have to systematically subtract out. And those that are infrared colony unsafe. So for example, your hadron spectrum, that's IRC unsafe. So you have to introduce a fragmentation function in a controlled way. Of course, it's not necessarily a problem, but you have to introduce, you have to rely on a non perturbative component. Um, and it turns out that this ZG observable is something that's um, not collinear safe, but you can still compute it without having to introduce a non perturbative component. And so that first seems like a contradiction. And, but what it means is that any fixed order calculation basically of that observable would fail. So if you look at any um, next leading order or next to next leading order calculation of this observable, you will always get end up with a diversion. So it's not calculable at fixed order. Um, but the way you can compute it, you basically need like an understanding of this observable to all orders. And once you resum it to all orders, you actually get a useful expression out. Um, and then once you have your all order result, you expand it back you know, in, in powers of alpha s, you find things like the square root of alpha s and so on. So these are things that you could never obtain, of course, with a fixed order calculation. Um, so it teaches us something very interesting, of course, about the all order structure of QCD. And it's very interesting uh, just from a theoretical point of view. It also has gotten a lot of attention uh, 
um, because this momentum sharing fraction here is at least as far as we know, that's the most direct measurement um, of the QCD splitting function. So the, the Alfarelli Parisi or the, the QCD splitting function is of course something um, that appears in many QCD calculations to evolve PDFs, to evolve um, um, uh, fragmentation functions and, and so on and so forth. Um, but usually you're not gonna measure it basically directly. You don't, normally don't have access to the splitting function itself um, in a direct way. Um, and it turns out without observable, you actually do measure that directly, which is because of this unusual all order structure here. And so in that sense, of course, also really important for any medium calculations because people always think about medium uh, splitting functions and so on, and that basically allows you to measure that in the most direct way possible. Um, and so um, we recently extended this calculation uh, basically beyond leading log for the first time. So we can, for the first time, sort of have a useful way of thinking about uncertainties for these things. Um, and so, of course, the way again to do the calculation is that we have to introduce just an additional jet function. Right? What I mentioned before, if you think about um, jet substructure, what we have to do is introduce a jet function that's sensitive or that knows about the momentum fraction that's contained in the jet. So we have again a curly G here that depends on the variable Z. Um, and then it needs to depend on the jet substructure observable that we're interested in. And so the way one can do these calculations um, is by basically um, at fixed order, you can only do the calculation if you do introduce an additional variable. So in this case, uh, we not only introduce the variable ZG, but we also introduce the variable theta G. So if you look again at this kind of graph, or it appears as the Arturelli Parisi splitting functions. And then in addition to that, you basically have to measure the opening angle of that particular branching process in, uh, uh, in your jet as well. Um, and that basically appears here as one of a theta G, where theta G is, is just RG, so the opening angle divided by the jet radius. And from there, you can basically see that from this fixed order expression, you can see that I cannot integrate out theta G, because um, I basically just would hit a singularity here when, whenever theta G becomes zero. And so that basically tells me, like any fixed order calculation, also if I go to an analog, so I would, I would never you know, get a finite result for that, that cross section. Um, but what I can do, and I'm not going to show the details, um, but just to illustrate the point, what I can do is I can resum, uh, do a joint resummation of logarithms in ZG and logarithms in theta G, so both of those at the same time, and then I can actually integrate out theta G. And then what I find I end up with is really just the splitting functions over here. So I cannot integrate out theta G at any fixed order, but I can integrate it out once I've actually performed the resummation and one can actually analytically write down what the answer is for this. Um, and so let me show you some comparisons uh, to data. Um, here we did some phenomenology for the Large Hadron Collider, um, comparing to Atlas data now with next leading log. Um, you can see this actually agrees very well uh, with the data um, over here. So it's really a very direct measurement of you know, these, these type of splitting functions and so on. And um, we can also make predictions now here for the EIC. Um, where we're, of course, at much lower energies, as I showed before, this is for relatively high um, <clears throat> uh, jet transverse momenta uh, in the range of 30 to 40 GeV, um, which is sort of the higher end, as I showed at the beginning. And here, you really want to go to as high a PT as possible, because if you groom your jet, right, as, as illustrated here, you want to identify a particular hard splitting. Um, and you're also going to remove some things that are soft. Right, so, so if I start with 10 particles, I groom away some, and then I still want to split it into two branches to measure basically a splitting, I better have enough you know, particles to do that. Right? Um, and so for these type of like groomed observables, um, by, they're theoretically very interesting. And um, for example, here we can study hadronization corrections to this. We can study um, the differences between quarks and gluons, which are basically not existent at leading log, um, but at higher orders they exist. And so at the EIC, we can actually much more precisely um, than at the LHC um, pin down some of these, these effects. Um, but of course, where we have to go to is really the higher end tail uh, of the PT spectrum where we have a sufficient number of particles. Um, so that's really something one has to keep in mind um, that these things really only work if we have uh, enough PT. Of course, like if it works at sufficiently high PT, we can see how far one can push things down. Um, but one definitely has to make sure that things first of all work 
um, sort of the higher PT and sort of the higher energy versions um, of the EIC. Okay, so this I wanted to bring up basically because it's um, a really independent and new component, right, that, that um, initially at the EIC, when, when people started basically the planning process was not really considered. Um, these observables are of course new, right, that came in 2015, only now their results um, to really go beyond leading logs. So these are really sort of new developments and, and therefore not sort of part of the traditional uh, uh, EIC um, program. But of course, these are very interesting. And so um, uh, now like in the, the yellow report, they're actually all, uh, all included. <clears throat> okay. Um, so we talked about 3D imaging, uh, TMDs, and now CG. And so um, there's of course a lot more things um, that one can explore. I wanna show two examples here. Uh, before coming to the uh, last part of my talk, um, which is um, one interesting work here by um, Giannis Macris, where he basically found, well, the, sometimes it's not so good because the, uh, to groom jets at the EIC because, you know, that, as I just mentioned, they don't have that many particles, right? Um, but what I can do, for example, is I can actually groom the entire event. So if I'm interested in specific groomed observables like ZG, I can actually make use of all the particles in the event and just groom that entire event. And I have an advantage, for example, that I have more particles uh, to, to deal with, and I can make push that probably to lower energies than I could if I just look at a single jet. And so he, he basically did, uh, made some very interesting, um, uh, proposed some interesting techniques how to actually do event-wide uh, grooming uh, in, in deep enough state scattering processes. Um, there's also a connection actually between um, grooming and TMDs, in particular TMD fragmentation functions. Um, I mentioned before that one can measure hadrons um, relative to the jet axis um, inside a jet, and one can actually measure them not just relative to the standard jet axis that I, I just identify with my jet algorithm, but I can measure that relative to a groomed jet axis. So I first groom my jet, remove soft particles, I get a new axis, and then I measure any hadrons that are left in that jet relative to that jet axis. And that at first sounds very similar to you know, not grooming the jet, but it has a very interesting aspect, which is that I have in my grooming condition, um, additional parameters like this Z cut parameter or the beta parameter um, that I showed before in this grooming condition, right? These are basically parameters that I can choose. I can choose basically for whatever I can do the calculation, right? And so, what I can then do is like, depending on what value I choose for Z cut, I get a different jet axis and I get a different transverse momentum spectrum relative to that axis. And so um, what uh, the authors here in this paper noticed is that um, I do that, I have basically an additional parameter that I can vary. And I can basically use that to test TMD evolution. Um, so, so normally if I wanna think about TMD evolution, I have a hard scale, like a transverse, sorry, a, a hard scale Q and a transverse momentum. And to test TMD evolution, I basically want to vary that hard scale rate, right? and that that gives me uh, a handle on TMD evolution. Um, with grooming, I can actually also do that by just varying the grooming parameters, and that basically gives me an additional handle to test and probe um, um, TMD evolution uh, in using jet physics. And so you can see here, for example, a bunch of model predictions and how they change by varying basically the grooming parameters here. So um, that's also really interesting uh, to to see. Okay. So I think I still have a little bit of time, so uh, maybe like a couple minutes. Um, and so I briefly wanted to mention something that's not directly jet physics, um, <clears throat> but it's basically something that came out of jet physics and now has sort of an impact on the way we think about hadron production. And so that's uh, what I mentioned um, a few times before, which is how we can compute actually hadrons coming from the perspective um, of jet physics. And so the motivation for that um, is that both these jet functions that I talked about quite a bit um, and fragmentation functions basically have the exact same evolution equation. They have the same factorization structure and I basically just have to switch out these two, right? And in the RG evolution, that basically means that I start with my hard scale PT or Q or, or whatever. And for a jet, I basically would evolve down to the jet scale PT times R. By doing that, I raise some logarithms in the ratios or logarithms in the jet radius. Um, but of course, that radius R is something I can choose. Right? I can choose it to be one and I can choose it to be very small. And so um, basically by make, choosing it to be very small, I basically um, can lower it all the way down to zero. Um, 
or at least that's sort of the idea, right? Because that's exactly what I would be doing for hadrons, right? For hadrons, I would evolve from my hard scale um, all the way down to a lambda QCD or one GV or wherever I parameterize my fragmentation function. And so what I can do is I can just lower that value here of the radius R and basically um, bridge this gap all the way down here. Um, and that basically is, is what I said before. So if I lower my jet radius and make every jet very small, which is contain a single hadron, and in that limit of R to zero, I should basically just recover my hadron cross-section. Um, so that idea, of course, has been around for a while, but um, it wasn't really clear how to, how to do that in practice. Um, of course, the lower end of the scale, I will not know. That will be non-perturbative. But everything else might actually be perturbative. And so if one does that in a naive way, that completely fails. Um, if I just take the jet function, I roll it down to you know, one GV, I get something that doesn't look like anything like a fragmentation spectrum. Um, and the reason for that, that it doesn't work, are these small z logarithms. So if you remember before, I showed this jet function that had three large logarithms at next leading order. It had jet radius logarithms that we resumed through this deep lab evolution. It had threshold logs, you can also resum. And then there were, there were these small z logarithms as well. And it turns out that they are basically the problem. Like if I just do it in a naive way and try to recover hadron physics from jet physics, then that's basically what spoils everything. And so these small z logarithms are actually really tricky to deal with. Um, they appear in different parts of the cross section. So as I showed before, um, we, if you want to write down a cross section, we basically have a hard function and a jet function. And so here I'm writing that out in a little bit a different way. We have a hard function. Then in between, I basically have this D-Lab evolution factor, right, for my evolution over here. And then I have a jet function at the end, right? And so these small z logarithms actually appear in all three parts um, of that cross section. And so, you know, before these jet functions were developed, people knew about small z logs in these two components, but this part basically was kind of missed because people didn't think about hadrons as jet physics. Right? And so you have to basically include the small z logarithms in all these three components. And as it turns out, that actually, to some extent, works. Um, so one has to resume these small z logs. The way to do this, I'm not going to go into detail, is through a reciprocity connection to small x physics, to BFKL physics and the initial state. Um, using that, one can write down an uh, angular order D-Lab evolution equation that is shown here. Um, it's not too important what exactly that equation is. One sort of important aspect, if you want to go beyond leading log with this, which is really what you have to do for phenomenology, you have to keep the um, uh, uh, regularization parameters. You basically have to introduce two uh, variables um, to, to regularize divergences. Um, and then only after you solve that evolution equation, you can take the limit of epsilon to zero. So that's the typical dimensional regularization epsilon. So I can only take that to zero after I solve the evolution equation. Um, and then once I do that, I basically resum um, all of the small z logs in, in, in that cross section over here. Um, and then so, and then I can actually compare them um, to data, um, to in this case E plus A minus data, but we can do it a similar way for EIC um, hadron cross sections. And it turns out that purely perturbatively, one can actually get the shape of the cross section right. Um, so all that is basically needs to be fitted um, is um, basically the cutoff. So what do I call a jet with zero radius, right? That's like one GeV or half a GeV or whatever, right? Like that number is inherently non-perturbative, but everything else, it looks like it's actually pretty much perturbative. I can pretty much, uh, or, or really well with a really good chi-squared, um, describe these kind of hadron spectra that come out from lab here plotted as a function of one of the ZH. So the small ZH region is over here. And once I resum all the ZH logs, I basically don't even have to introduce a fragmentation function anymore, but at least for these charged hadrons at sufficiently high energies, um, I can actually just do a purely perturbative calculation coming sort of from jet physics. So in that sense, jet physics sort of en encompasses both. It has jet physics aspects and I can take, or it can basically recover hadron physics as a limiting factor. Um, and I don't potentially don't need, need it in fragmentation functions anymore. And it's pretty much all, um, uh, uh, all perturbative, as it turns out, at least um, up to basically just fitting some numbers, but I don't necessarily have to fit a functional form anymore. So this is, of course, at the very beginning. It's not clear how one can push if one can push that to low energies, and you know potentially will break down at some point. Um, but in some sense, I wanted to bring it up because jet physics not only has sort of an impact on jet physics itself, 
um, but it seems it also now has really an impact here in, in this work from Daphne um, on um, basically hadron cross sections um, and and sort of like a lot of other things um, that you know were not, that are not traditionally uh, associated uh, with jet physics. Okay, so that was basically the last thing I wanted to mention. So uh, we started out with jets as sort of this window to very short-lived quantum processes at these very small uh, uh, distances and, and subatomic scales. Um, it's really a, sort of an up-and-coming new component um, of the EIC science program. And of course, really at the beginning, it's and by far not as well established as some of the other things where you have detailed studies about the impact. Um, so that's not the case here. So there's many new opportunities um, really in jet physics uh, in this direction. Um, and, and I just briefly wanted to advertise that um, because it's really a new component, um, there's uh, this new workshop series uh, that's called Jets for 3D Imaging at DIC. The second version of that is going to be here actually at uh, Stony Brook next week. Um, anyone, can, anyone can, of course, attend this hybrid format, so everyone's welcome to do that. Uh, and that's also going to be a third version at UCLA and so on. So um, there's, of course, a lot of new things to discuss, and, and, and I hope that will be interesting uh, to, to some of you also in the future. Um, so with that, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Felix, for the very nice talk. So uh, are there uh, any questions? Uh, OK. Uh, I have uh, one question. I mean, I think on slide uh, 61, uh, when you when you studied, uh, when you mentioned the, uh, okay, there was, maybe it was a bit later. I mean, in, in your very last part of, of the talk, there was, uh, you, you, you said about uh, using Diglab evolution equations uh, to study the, uh, I mean, yeah, uh, could you could you go maybe to some uh, different slide? Mm -hmm. Yeah, to some different slides. Yes. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. So so uh, so is there uh, some assumptions here which which you which allows you to use the DigLab or maybe uh, I mean is, would it be uh, possible to use some equation which also uh, evolves in which takes into account some transverse momentum or is it is it necessary DigLab? Yeah, or DigLab splitting function. Right. So, so it's 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 definitely more than that. Um, so, so DigLab is basically that would only be like the regular DigLab, right? That would not allow you to, to <coughs> sorry, to describe hadron spectra, right? Um, so, so you have to basically change to a different evolution equation, uh, which is which is this one. This one you can actually solve to n three LL. Um, I mean, it's, it has sort of this this difficult structure um, and. But one can basically compare to like different calculation um, by Andreas Vogt and where well, he didn't have an evolution equation, he sort of just um, sort of had an intuition of how to build up that cross section for the final state. Um, versus here we basically obtained um, that evolution equation, this more complicated evolution equation, um, by making this connection to to the initial state um, and using basically the BFKL mm -hmm. equation. Uh, mm -hmm. Then using a like stereographic, uh, uh, stereographic mapping to the final state right on the celestial sphere, um, and that basically gives you that evolution equation here. Um, and then, yes, like you know, by by solving that, you resum the small z logs. I mean, okay, so so this is basically the small z logs in the DGAP evolution, and then you still need the small z logs in the jet function, the heart function. Um, and if you put all these things together, right, like like the small z logs in all three components. Um, then you basically can describe basically this humpback plateau that that people okay, um, okay. Um, always discuss, right? And sort of th the problem before was that basically one piece was missing. So the like some of the the um, humpback plateau calculations only basically looked at this piece over here. Um, but then if you combine it with a hard function, there's almost a cancellation between things. Um, mm -hmm. And so the the missing piece was basically the the one of the jet functions. So if you include that as well. Um, then you know there's no cancellation right and, and you actually really get a nice description um, of, of the entire spectrum from large to small z like it, like surprisingly right in, in this figure it even works in the large z region where you don't necessarily expect it to work right um, but it just seems to work right so that's something I think one has to still understand better why it works so well um, but that's sort of right like these entire things are described with like two parameters right two numbers and, and no um, sort of um, a functional form on, on Z. Yeah.
Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, okay, uh, I didn't see any, any ah, yes, uh, Janusz Fastowski has a question. So, Janusz, uh, please go ahead. Felix, in, in page 60, you show this, yeah, these two drawings, which are actually done for very different values of the parameters for the, for the dropping soft. How it comes that they are so similar? Because the beta for EIC is zero, while for LHC it is one. Right, right, right. Um, yes. So, so the right thing. So, 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 so you can do different things, right? Like one is. So ideally, what you want to. So if you want to measure the QCD splitting function, if that's the goal, you should choose beta equals zero, and so that's what I'm doing on the right. Um, I chose beta one on the left because like there's also LAC data, of course, for beta equals zero and it also works, but I, I, don't, I just chose beta equals one um, because like the, the agreement is just like so unusually good. <laughs> um, like it's, it's also okay for beta equals zero, um, but it's maybe like not quite as nice as this one. Um, that's why I chose beta equals one. And so this is not exactly the QCD splitting function in a way, right? This really like so, so the analogy with the splitting function anyway just works with really the leading log strictly at leading log and beyond that you basically have to compute corrections um and it's just you know like a regular cross section it's just that your leading log approximation is really the qc splitting function and um <clears throat> and and so you can sort of see right that this is sort of the in both cases right this is like the qc splitting function that has this one over z behavior uh in general um and like that, that's sort of like one of the interesting aspects, right? Like, it, like of, of the Sudikov safety that even though these are jets for 30 GV and these are jets for 300 GV as a factor of 10 difference, but basically because of the Sudikov safety, your, your, your um, first correction basically does not have an alpha S dependence. And so that basically makes it pretty much scale invariant. Um, and that's something that, that you get because of this, this, you know, this, this strange all order behavior. Um, otherwise, you know, you would definitely have a, you know, at least you would have a change um, and because of alpha s, but here to first approximation, you actually get rid of that. Um, so that's, again, it's, it's like an unusual behavior of, of the cross section, but that's basically what that confirms, right? That, that for, even though we measure this for very low or high PT jets, this, this core of the jet basically is, is sort of invariant pretty much up to, Thanks you know, co computable co corrections. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Uh, I don't see any. So uh, thank you, uh, Felix, again.